fun. Uh, today I'm going to talk about anxiety. Anybody ever experience anxiety out there? Yeah, yeah, it is all over the place, uh, specifically nowadays. So um, that's what we're going to talk about. I want to call your attention to a few different things, but uh, this is anxiety, you know, really understanding what it is, and it's really around uncertainty. So the title of my sermon is actually Uncertain. It's living in a, an anxiety-filled world because it's all over the place out there. I remember uh, I used to do a lot of flying uh, when I was in a different uh, role in, in my job, and uh, I would fly all over. I mean, I was really good at the whole airport thing. And uh, one night, I was flying into Altoona Airport, and it was foggy. And I mean, it was dense, thick fog. We didn't know if we were one foot off the ground or a thousand feet off the ground. You couldn't see anything. And the, the pilot came on and told us to fasten our seatbelts. It was going to be a bumpy ride. It was going to be a bumpy landing. And that they were flying using IFR instrument flight rules that means they have no idea what's in front of them they have to trust the information that they get from their instruments and and because they trust their instruments they're able to fly and i was able to do it because i trusted her our pilot and uh, we were coming in and, and and the way this this works is the tower will give instructions go here, turn left, do this, do that. And their instruments will tell them different things. You're this high up, the wind speed is this, this is how fast you're going. All this information that they're getting. And the pilot trusted both those. I trusted her, but can I be honest just for a minute? I had a lot of anxiety, okay? Not that I'm a control freak, but when I'm not in control, I go crazy. Our lives can be like that. Our lives can be out of control, out of our control. And they often are. And you're probably sitting there right, right now going, yeah, that's me, that's totally my life right now, this is crazy. But let me explain uh, how those, those bits of information you get from these sources, the tower, the instruments, how they translate into having a good flight and things like that. A recently licensed pilot was flying his private plane in, on a cloudy day, and he was not very experienced in instrument reading or an instrument landing. When the control tower was to bring him in, he began to get panicky. He was worried because he had no confidence in self. He had never done it. He was worried about it. Then a stern voice came over the radio. You just obey the instructions, and we will take care of the obstructions. Obey the instructions, and he will move the obstructions. As long as your information source is from God, he can move those things in your path that will do you harm. But if you try to fly on your own and do things your own way and read your instrument panel that's not calibrated correctly, maybe it's calibrated towards the world instead of the cross, you have a good chance of crashing your plane. And we don't want to be like that. Anxiety is a real thing. It is out there. Did you guys know that there's an actual anxiety score? There's a score, a national anxiety score. Yeah, it's on a scale from zero to 100, and it goes across age groups, across people of different races, ethnicities, among men, among women, by generation. And uh, I want to show you what a couple of these look like. So when we take a look at this first list, 
we have the silent or greatest generation, or people born from 1928 to 1945. They're generally 75 to 92 years old. Some of you may be here. Some of you may be watching. Baby boomers are, are ages 56 to 74. Generation X are those born from 1965 to 1980, which is probably the best generation. I'm just saying. Uh, next, we have the millennials, and they were born from 1981 to 1996. Their ages are 24 to 39. And Generation Z, is anyone born from 1997 through 2012? These folks are 8 years old to 23 years old right now. So why do I want to show you all of those people? Well, I want to tell you, anxiety is, is indiscriminate. It affects every one of those categories. Now, some of you didn't even hear that because you're still stuck on the fact that your age puts you in that class. You're saying, there's no way that I am there because I am young at heart. Yes, you're there, and so am I. <laughs> Everybody struggles with this anxiety. In fact, the, uh, the silent generation, they have anxiety. The baby boomers actually had the largest increase in their anxiety number. So if you're in that age from 56 to 74, you guys have actually had the highest increase in reported anxiety amongst your demographic. When you look at millennials, the millennials have the most anxiety out there. And those people are 24 to 39. And I think that makes great sense, doesn't it? Because they're, they're starting families, they're buying houses, they're maybe changing jobs. You know, all of these things create anxiety in, in, in your life. And these folks have the most anxiety. And Generation Z. Now... Guys, these people are eight years old through 23. And I know you guys are all sitting there going, what do they have to be anxious about? You know, which shoes I'm going to wear? Is it Cocoa Puffs or Cocoa Pebbles? Which, you know, which, how, how hard can your choices really be? They really are hard. 91% of Generation uh, Z people say they suffer from anxiety. And those of you that have Generation Z children, you just gave me a high five and an amen because you know what it's like trying to get them to do anything. You have to prod them a little bit to get them to do something because of that anxiety. It's not just them, though. See, there are 40 million people in the United States suffering from anxiety. And, and it, broken out by gender, it looks like this. Women have, 23.4% uh, of women say they have uh, moderate to severe anxiety, which is more than men. But men, we still have it. I know, we act like we have it all together, you know, and we would never let you guys know we don't, but we don't. We are anxious. We, we, we live with this. So I wanted to ask you this morning, what is it that you're worried about? What is it that's causing you to have anxiety this morning? Is it knowing that Thanksgiving is just like, you know, 15 minutes away and all the government agencies say you can have three people at your table, so one of, you got to pick a kid to actually not come to Thanksgiving? What is it that is causing you stress right now? Is it the fact that, that a lot of places are talking about shutting down and you know that if you shut down, that means no job? And that no job comes a stone's throw from no Christmas? Yeah. There's a lot of people today realizing that what they thought they trusted in, they faith, we, we, we're getting back to normalcy, that it's starting to strip away from us that it's starting to pull back. The, the anxiety you feel today, is it worse than 2020? Has 2020 caused you to have more anxiety? 
I think that will be a resounding yes. I just saw someone on the live stream stand up and say, yes, yeah, because it has. Now, I remember when Christy and I were, were walking around a jewelry store, um, they have these things called Pandora bracelets. Have you ever seen those? Yeah, I think someone bought a Pandora's box instead. And when they opened it up, January 1st, this is what happened. It's so crazy. But this, back, back up a minute to this Generation Z, right? Why would they be so worried? An eight-year-old, someone that's 10, 11. I've got kids in that, that age range. I've got tons of kids next door, youth group in that age range. Why are they so anxious? Well, there's several contributing factors that I found in my research. One, they have high levels of loneliness. Another thing is there's a substitution of social media for a true friendship network. They don't have friends like the, the baby boomers or Generation X or any of those. Like, do you remember when, uh, when summertime came and you got on your bike and you just went? And then you came back when? When the lights came on, exactly. That was your alarm clock. Got to be back. They don't do that, do they? they it's, it's a fake friendship. And some of the friendships that you those bonds that you made last to today. And some, thankfully, haven't. I remember as a kid, I did a lot of crazy things. I cannot tell you, I think it was true intervention from God that YouTube didn't start until after I was grown. Because if I could have any video evidence of the things that I did, I would be probably in jail. I don't know. I don't know if, if those things are illegal. Uh, I do remember going and fishing somewhere, and uh, I was actually in college. My, we loved the fish. Uh, whenever we could get, get away from school, me and my friend, we would go fishing. And uh, it was getting late, but uh, we, were going, we went to the Susquehanna River. Cool. Big river fishing. This is going to be just going to be awesome. And we fished, and we caught the biggest fish. I mean, these things, and this is not a fish tail. These things were this big and that big around. And my, my Kmart fishing rod could barely take it. And we were just high on the cloud. We were just so excited. And then we walked back to the car and we walked past a sign. And when we got on the other side of the sign, I looked and it said, protected area, no fishing allowed. We never read it because we didn't come in that way. That's the way we went out. But yeah, if we would have documented that, I might have to live stream this from some Williamsport correctional facility this morning. But these Generation Z folks, they've got a constant bombardment of negative self-comparisons. You remember you went to school and you could see everybody's clothes. And if your clothes were maybe not so great, right? Maybe you had patches on your jeans. Now that's cool, right? Back then, you were poor, but you only realized it when you went somewhere like school or something like that and saw people. Now it's in your face 24-7. So they deal with this constant bombardment of negative self-comparisons. And there's a narrowing definition of life success that leads to destruction, destructionist perfectionism or all-or-nothing thinking. They often won't do something because they know they can't be the best. They often will will cause themselves to fail because they can't be the best. And uh, a lot of that has to do with cell phones and social media. And it's not just them, it's all of us. We are all susceptible to anxiety caused by external forces. And uh, there is a documentary that's on Netflix right now, and it's really good. And if you have Netflix, I ask you to go out and watch this thing. It's called The Social Dilemma. And what it talks about is the effect of social media 
on people and how it actually changes the way you think. And it's designed that way. It's designed to create that effect. It's very eye-opening. You, after you watch it, you will change a few things. I have notifications turned off on my phone. And, uh, you know, one of the things they, they say on there that I thought was, was really interesting was, so do you check your phone before you go to the bathroom in the morning or while you go to the bathroom? That's the only two options. These things take over our lives. So make sure that you get a chance to see that. But what I want you to realize this morning is that life is uncertain. We have uncertainty. Life is uncertain, but God is not. Let me say that again so you get it. Life is uncertain, but God is not. Say that with me. Life is, but God is, there you go. That is the absolute truth. So what you're going through, that anxiety you feel, the uncertainty, that's normal. But God is unwavering. God is the same. God is not uncertain. He should be your foundation that you can put your foot on and know, as long as I'm here, I'm safe. We, uh, we did a camping trip with a group, uh, group of folks in uh, early October. And uh, we went out and there was a, a big creek with these large rocks on it. And there's certain spots where you could step that were safe and certain ones that were not. As long as you were standing on a rock that didn't move, you could do anything. You could do poses, you could take selfies, you could dance, I guess. I don't, you could do anything because your foot was firm on that solid rock. But if, if, you, if you weren't and you were on one of those wobbly rocks, the only thing you wanted to do was get off of that rock. We need to have a firm foundation. But this anxiousness causes us to, to waver, to be tossed back and forth. I want to call to your attention Philippians 4, 6 and 7. It says, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious about nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. If you're anxious, if you're struggling with something, talk to God. That's basically what that says. Reach out to God. When you are anxious, when you're being tossed and turned and your footing is off, reach out and grab something solid. Grab the cross. Grab the rock of Christ. And that will hold, hold you there. Check this out, the next piece. And once you do that, once you grab a hold of it, what's going to happen? This is so cool. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I love that. I love that. You'll instantly get peace if your foot lands on that rock, if your, if your hand reaches out and touches that solid thing. You will get peace. But it's hard for us to do that. It's hard for us to remember that. Why? Well, because the cross is right there in church. And if I'm not at church, how can I grab it? And there's really not a rock here. It's just kind of a stage, platform. If you're not drawing close to God, you'll never feel it. You'll never feel that rock. You'll never feel that cross if you're not drawing close. But when you are, it's always there. Look, what, it's not that, look, it's not that cross. It's this one. Okay? It's not this stage, it's this rock that I'm standing on. When you're close to God, you can feel it. So don't worry so much. Don't have all that anxiety. In fact, we're told that over and over and over. In Proverbs 27, it says, Don't boast about tomorrow. For you do not know what a day may bring forth. Now, when you look at that, you'll say, well, I'm not going to boast. That means like to brag. Don't brag about tomorrow. Well, let's just flip it over. Let's take it conversely. 
don't worry about tomorrow. Don't fret about tomorrow. Don't freak out about tomorrow. Don't feel down about tomorrow because you don't know what a day may bring forth. God can show up in your life. That thing that you're worried about, it might be absolutely nothing. God will show up. He does that. Anxiety and fear can be paralyzing. It can be paralyzing. It keeps you from living your life. It keeps you from enjoying your life. It keeps you from enjoying what you have. But instead, you focus on what you don't have. Or even worse, on what others have. And that can be paralyzing. It's, it's like having a rope that slowly binds you, little by little by little, that just ties you up completely, that you can't get out of, over and over, no matter what you do, you can't get out of it. Let me give you an example. Hey, Corey, can you come here for a second? Those of you that may have hunted, do you guys know what this is called? It is a rope. Good job, Jack. It's actually called a snare. And if you are just walking through life and you're, you're oblivious, you don't know what's up, you don't, you're not thinking about anything, you're doing your own thing and you happen to look over and see other people. You don't ever do that, I know. I knew that. But you see that they have the nicer truck. He's always looking at my truck. I'm just saying. <laughs> you see all the different things, and you get caught up in it, and you begin to be a little anxious. Oh, if I only made more, if I only did this, if I only did that, it has an effect on you. So you're just walking through life, okay? And then, do you see that? And it's not just that, it's trying not to tie his leg up here too much, right? So he's going to get out of this, guys. Watch how he gets out of it. Just spin in a circle for me. Keep going. Keep going. That's it. Keep spinning. There you go. What's happening, guys? He's trying to do it on himself. That's exactly right. Thanks, Corey. You all right? Okay. Listen, thanks, buddy. I want to show you this verse. Take a look at this. The fear of the man brings a, a what? A snare. Fear will cause you to be snared just like Corey was. As you walk through that thing that you're dealing with, it brings real fear. And fear can be a snare. And a snare will tie you up. It will immobilize you. It will paralyze you. It will allow you to not live your life or enjoy what you have. But whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. We all have fear. And fear is something we're always going to be, you know, it's always going to be a part of us. But it doesn't have to be all of it. If we trust in the Lord we can actually be safe. But a lack of experience in God's power often causes fear and anxiety. What do you mean? Well, if you've not ever seen God come through, then you have fear that He won't. But if you have, have consistently seen God over-deliver and, and come through whenever you need Him, you've got a bit of a... Uh, a confidence that people don't understand why you have this confidence because you've seen it if we've never seen the greatness of his power we don't know that God is able but those who have seen it can attest to those who haven't 
So you've been through something, you share that with someone who's going through something. Let me say that one more time. If you have been through something, then you share that with someone who is now going through something. Amen? Amen. Jesus said, if you're hungry, I'm bread. I'm the bread of life. He's also a doctor in a sick room. He's a lawyer, our advocate in the courtroom. Stands up for us when no one else will. He's a mother to the motherless, a father to the fatherless. He is a friend to the friendless. The Bible says Jesus is a friend of sinners. So what do we do with all this information? Well, one thing we can do is listed in Deuteronomy 31.6, and it says, Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear, nor be afraid of them, those things in your life. For the Lord your God, He is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. When you think you are alone, you're not. When you think you're down and out, you're not. He is the one that goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. That's God's promise. And I think we need that. Our anxiety needs that. We're almost done. I want you to grab your Bible. For those of you online, you can just click the, the Bible. There's a little Bible button, and it'll pull up the, the Bible verses right there for you. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 28, and we're going to start in verse 10. This is a story about Jacob. Jacob is on his way somewhere. He's, he's taking a trip. And he knows where he's going to go. But God says, I know where you think you're going. But I'm going to show you where I'm going to take you. We all, we all sort of have an idea of where our life's taking us, where we're going to go. But God says, you might want to go here, but I'm going to bring you here. And there's a purpose behind it. So take a look. Uh, chapter 10, or, uh, verse 10. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went towards Haran. Jacob was on his way from something, and he was on his way to something. Anybody here? Anybody online? Are you guys trying to leave something behind? Is there some, some event, something you want to put in your past? But... But it doesn't, it seems like as you walk forward, it just gets closer and you can't shake it. That thing is, it's like it's chasing you. Jacob was leaving Beersheba, trying to get away from Beersheba, and he was going towards Haran. Maybe you're trying to get to something now. Maybe, maybe there's something you're trying to reach. There's something you have in your mind. This is what I want. And I'm trying to get there. But it just seems like every time I walk there, it moves further away. It's like you're on one of those people movers at the airport. It doesn't matter how fast you walk if you're walking in the wrong direction. Because you'll never go any further than where you are. Jacob knew where he was going, but he was on his way. But God. Let's look at verse 11. So he came to a, what's that say? Certain place. He came to a certain place and he stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and he put it at his head and he lay down in that place to sleep. You see, he didn't arrive at Haran. He didn't get to his final destination. He didn't get to where his goal in his mind was set. He didn't get there. He was trying to get there, but something stopped him. He was not that far away from Beersheba, but God led him to a certain 
place. In a world of uncertainty, God will lead us to a certain place. Does that make sense? We here all have uncertainty in our lives, and God says, I know you have that. I'm going to lead you to a certain place. And while he was there, verse 12 says, He dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up upon the earth, and its top reached heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. And the land on which you lie, I will give to your descendants. Also your, to your descendants, I shall be, they shall be as the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south, and in you and in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Jacob's ladder. That's what we're talking about. You guys all have heard this story before. Well, what's this Jacob's ladder thing? What's it, what's it represent? Well, it's a ladder that the top reaches heaven. And what's on it, by the way? Do you remember? Angels. And what are these angels doing? They're going up and they're coming down. Why? Did you ever ask yourself that question? Why? Why are they going up and down? Is it just a fun thing? Are they at Bland's Park? Del Grosso Park? Wee! This ladder's fun. They're going up and they're going down, doing the work of God on earth. They're doing the will of God for you. They're involved in God's plan for your life. It represents God's continual work. Up and down, over and over, just to execute God's plan for you. Jacob was given information about God's promise right there. Do you, do you remember that? Jacob was told God's promise for him at that spot. Do you wish God would give you some promises? You wish God would give you some security? You stopped reading too soon. He has. He has promised you many things. He has told you all of this. It's in His Word. Take a look at the next verse, verse 15. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back into this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. He's with you, and He will keep you. Now, keep means protect. Think, think the football, right? You got the football guy, and he puts, does this kind of thing. That's a keep. He's going to keep you wherever you go. So no matter where this journey takes you, even if it's a bit far, He will bring you back into this land, to this certain place. In this world of uncertainty, God wants to bring you to this certain place. What was Jacob's reaction? We catch this in verse 16. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was there even if Jacob did not realize. The promise was already in place. Jacob didn't even realize it. You know, when, when you take a baby and you throw them up in the air, the baby's reaction is they giggle. Because the baby has trust that they'll be caught. The mom's reaction is nothing like that. <laughs> the promise was in place. They have the trust. Verse 17 says that he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven where he sees this happening. This place 
where I can meet God face to face is the house of God. And what's a house? House is where you live. The house of God in ancient times was the temple. And we already know that we are the temple of God. So it can be said about you. Surely the Lord is in this place and I didn't know it. Or I didn't, I didn't care to know. I didn't, I didn't think about it. I was doing my own thing, not realizing that He's right there with these promises. The gate of heaven, the doorway, the ability to connect to God, to squish down this anxiety that I feel, it's within us right now. We have the ability to rid ourselves of uncertainty, of fear, of anxiety, just simply by going to Him, and He's here right now, and we don't even realize it. Jacob was there, and he didn't know the Lord was in this place. Till he fell asleep and he saw God's work. I ask for you to see God's work in your life. Take a minute today. Look at how God intervened in your life. Unanswered prayers. Just look back at how many times you prayed for something and didn't get it, and now you look back and go, Boy, I'm so glad. So glad that didn't happen. As the musicians come, I want to... Uh, I want to go over one more time Philippians 4, 6, and 7. So I'm going to read it to you. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for what He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. You see, anxiety is defeated through prayer. So pray about everything. Tell God what you need. God, I don't need food. I need to be full. I don't need to feel better. Lord, I need to be healed. Then you will experience peace. Is that what that verse said? You will experience peace? No. It said you will experience God's peace, which is way different than regular peace. It's different. So while you're living in Christ Jesus, the peace will protect. It'll protect your heart. That's your feelings. It'll protect your mind. That's your anxieties. So you can have rest. And you can say, God is greater than my anxiety. That verse there in the corner says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you. Cast all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. All your anxieties, all the things you have, you take them, And you cast them at the cross and let them there. That's what you need to do. Let's pray together. Lord, we've covered so much ground this morning. And I know people sitting here and people sitting at home, they have the anxiety. They have the worries. But God, you have the remedy. You've got the solution and it's within them. They need to lean upon you, that solid rock. They need to put their hands upon you. God, your people are hurting, and they're stressed, even down to the eight-year-olds. And it's not about Fruity Pebbles, Lord. It's about big life things. God, you can fix all of it. I ask that your people today will realize that and they'll draw closer to you because, God, we need this. And, God, we need you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen.